Thank you. You may be seated. That was a little shorter than usual for me to get up and get the internet system running and the recording systems. Our technicians are not here today. Please take your Bible and uh, turn with me, if you will, back to that passage in Exodus that we looked at a few moments ago. Exodus chapter 6. We were looking at verses 1 through 6, especially verse 4 and verse 5. Exodus chapter 6, and we're focusing on verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 talks about the covenant of the land. It used to be called the Palestinian covenant until we have the problem of the Palestinian state today. But now we call it the covenant of the land. And then verse 5, which is the Abrahamic covenant, a very important covenant that God made, as you recall in the Old Testament, with Abraham, which has continuing blessings today. And we have entered into some of those blessings through the new covenant, which God has made with us. Now, so far, what we've seen, we've seen 25 things over the past seven weeks about the covenant of the land. It's rather extensive as you begin to study it through the Old Testament, the promise that God gave concerning a particular piece of real estate to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a rather important covenant because it has implications for what's going on today in the land of Israel. It has very important implications concerning what will take place during the millennial rule of Christ on earth, as prophesied in scripture. It has a lot of very interesting implications because it's tied to certain things related to King David. It's tied to certain things related to the Messiah himself. It's tied to specific passages in the book of Ezekiel where the millennial division of the land is very clearly laid out in its meets and bounds. And so as we've been looking at it, what we've learned so far is the covenant of the land sets the conditions for Israel to enter the promised land the first time. The covenant of the land set the conditions needed for them to remain in the land. It set the conditions necessary to ultimately inherit the entire scope of the land, which the Bible describes as extending from the Euphrates River on the east to the Nile River on the west. Israel has never yet inherited that much territory. Number four, it says that the land is an everlasting possession. Multiple places God said it would be an everlasting possession, not merely a temporary possession, but that God would hold it in escrow for them, which is number five. It guarantees that when Israel is expelled because of sin, God holds the land in escrow for them until he irresistibly brings them back to the land. Number six, it guarantees that God will bring them back because Jehovah's covenants with Israel cannot be broken. He says so himself. Number seven, the covenant of the land is an unconditional promise that therefore guarantees that Israel will be a nation in God's eyes forever. Number eight, the covenant of the land guarantees that the ultimate fulfillment is totally unconditional. It will be their land forever. Number nine, it is clearly a prophetic covenant. Number ten, God always fulfills prophecy literally, specifically, naturally, visibly, and physically. Number eleven, because future promises to Israel are prophetic, Therefore, the denial of the literal interpretation of prophecy is an attack on the inspiration of Scripture. It's a rather serious issue which we studied in some detail. The twelfth thing that we studied was believing prophetic truth results in holy living. What you believe changes your life. When people say to me, oh, I'm a Christian, I say, all right, so how has it changed your life? If you believe the word of God, it will change the way that you deal with daily circumstances and the different responsibilities that you have. You have a different worldview. You have a Christian worldview. You see everything around you through the lens of scripture. Believing prophetic truth results in holy living. Number 13. We learned that Israel would be cast out of the land because of sin, and that's occurred, as you know, three different times with two restorations thus far and a partial restoration in progress right now. Number 14, Israel will be fully restored to the land upon repentance. There is some repentance. I have believing Jewish friends who live in the land today, have lived there for many years, and who are faithfully ministering the gospel of Christ to their unbelieving Jewish friends. There is a partial repentance, but there must be a full repentance. And that's number 15. Repentance must come before Messiah sets up his millennial kingdom. 
That was the essence of John the Baptist's message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, as he was the forerunner of the Messiah. We saw that repentance before the kingdom, number 16, was also the message of Jesus after Herod arrested John and killed him. We saw that repentance before the kingdom was also the message that Jesus told the disciples to preach, and we looked at many different passages where this is found in the New Testament. Last week, we learned that the message of repentance is the key to the covenant of the land, and that's very important. The message of repentance is key to the covenant of the land. Number 19, we learned that God will use the great tribulation, the Old Testament calls it the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of Jacob's sorrow, that great tribulation period to bring national Israel to repentance. And that's stated not only in the Old Testament, but we found it in the Gospels. We also saw it in the Pauline epistles. By the way, it's Pauline, not Pauline epistles. Pauline is a girl's name. Pauline is the, the epistles that Paul wrote. Uh, we saw that in Matthew 24, for example. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, either Jesus was just rattling his saber, sabers and batting his gums together, or else he's telling us the truth. He believed a real, literal tribulation was coming. And there are certain things that are going to happen during it. And he says them here. And then shall the sign of the, appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man. And Jesus used that term for himself more frequently than any other term or designation in the Gospels when he spoke of himself, the Son of Man. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Rather significant. That's what Jesus said. The Apostle Paul picks up that theme also and explains what's happening right now and why Israel has not yet come to full repentance. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Now you know the definition of a mystery from Ephesians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul explains that a mystery is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is now revealed under the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. There are 17 things that are called mysteries in the New Testament. That is, they weren't revealed in the Old Testament. When you look back at the Old Testament, you don't find them, but you find them called mysteries. It doesn't mean something that's spooky. It doesn't mean something that's a detective story. What it means is something that was hidden and is now being uncovered. That you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part, not totally, blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. We're living in that period of the times of the Gentiles right now. And there's going to come a fullness to that time, and it's going to be cut off. And right now there's a partial blindness to Israel. There are, there are Jews, many Jews in fact, coming to Christ, but the whole nation has not come to Christ as a group. That won't happen until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Verse 26, And so all Israel, there is the whole nation, shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That, by the way, is a promise that Paul is quoting out of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 20 and 21. It reads this way, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. That's repentance. Remember, that's our theme. That's what we're talking about. The key to the national restoration under the Messiah will be when they repent and turn to him as their Messiah. That turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them. We've been talking about a specific landed covenant that relates to national Israel. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. It's a powerful statement. That's what Paul quotes in Romans chapter 11. We notice that the covenant of the land is a promise that includes both halves of the divided kingdom. Paul has just mentioned Israel. Isaiah mentioned Israel. 
But Jeremiah also mentions Judah. You remember the kingdom was divided in the days of Rehoboam. Ten of the tribes went with Rehoboam, uh, or with uh, Jeroboam the first, up in northern Israel, and the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, remained with the descendant of David, Rehoboam. The northern ten tribes were taken into captivity by the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom did not fall to Sennacherib. You recall the days of Hezekiah, how Sennacherib set up a, 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 a siege against the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah was king, and Hezekiah, you know, cried out to the Lord for help because Sennacherib's general, Rav Shaka, had come and blasphemed the name of the Lord and had compared Jehovah to all the gods of all the nations around. Said, you know, the gods of Sepharvaim and the gods of, Arvad, uh, gods of Arvad and the gods of uh, these other places, they didn't stand against us because we've got the big god. Their god happened to be a god named Nisroch. And uh, after all, you think Jehovah's good? Well, yeah, he won't help you. We're going to beat Jehovah. And so... Hezekiah went and laid the scroll out, the message out in front of the Lord. And Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, Understand this, because they blasphemed the name of the Lord. He's not going to set up a bulwark against this city. He's not going to break the gates of this city. He's not going to get inside this city. By the way they came, he's going to return to his own land. And that night, the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrians. It says in the morning they were all dead corpses. And so Sennacherib's general Rav Shaka and Sennacherib returned to Assyria. And while Sennacherib was worshipping in the temple of the God that he was thought was so good, I mean he was doing the good thing that his God would require him to do, he was actually in front of the idol of that pagan God, two of his own sons, Adramelech and Sherezer, came in and killed him as he was worshipping the pagan god. God has a sense of humor. You think your god is so great he can't even protect you in his temple while you are worshipping him. Yes, we find that not only Israel but also Judah. Listen to what Jeremiah says. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, that's the Messiah, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Judah, of course, went into captivity later under Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. They didn't go under the king of Assyria, but because of wickedness, dating back particularly to the time of Manasseh, king of Judah, who filled Jerusalem with his blood, and he reigned 55 years, one of the longest reigning kings in all of the history of Judah. 55 years. He was 12 years old when he began to reign. His father was the godly king, King Hezekiah, to whom the prophecy was given that, that Sennacherib, the Assyrian, would not come into Jerusalem. But God had made it known to Hezekiah that he was going to die. And Hezekiah pouted. He lay on his bed, he rolled over and he wept, and he turned his face toward the wall and he said, Look at all the good stuff I did for you, God. Aren't you going to give me some kind of a break for that? And so God told Isaiah the prophet to turn around and go back and talk to Hezekiah. And God said through Isaiah the prophet to Hezekiah, You're going to get 15 more years. 15 more years. You know who was born during that time? Three years later, Manasseh was born. If Hezekiah had died when God had appointed his death, Manasseh would not have been born. Who knows what the difference would have been in the history of the southern tribes of Judah. Because Hezekiah fathered a son after the third year of the 15-year extension that God gave to him. And Manasseh began to reign at age 12. And he reigned for 55 years. And he did every wicked sin that can be imagined. He practiced all the abominations of the nation of Israel, the northern tribes. He practiced all the abominations of the heathen. He practiced witchcraft and sorcery. He practiced astrology. He set up special places on the two different sides of the court of the temple for astrological worship. And even though there was a later repentance under Josiah, 
God said, yet because of the sins of Manasseh, I'm still going to send judgment on Judah. Nebuchadnezzar attacked in 605 BC. That was the first deportation. Then he attacked again in 597 and leveled the city of Jerusalem. And then in 586, he made the final deportation to the land of Babylon, which is where we find Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And we find Daniel at the end of a 70-year period of time, because Jeremiah, the one we've just been reading, Jeremiah prophesied that the Babylonian captivity would be 70 years long exactly. God's prophecies are not fuzzy. They are exact, precise, specifically, and literally fulfilled. And that's what you find in the book of Daniel, why he begins to repent and fast and pray that God will bring them back because the time is almost finished. People, the Bible is a fascinating book, not merely of stories. It is the work of God in history. And there's a real God. There's a living God. And so as we talk about the covenant of the land, remember that. That is the God who made these promises to a nation which wasn't in existence for 2,000 years and God built them as he promised specifically in his word in a day a nation was born, 1948. And they're coming back as he said he would draw them as with a fisherman's hooks. He would draw them back to the land yet in unbelief. But there would come a time when God says, all right, I've drawn you back, now I want you to repent. And what is necessary for me to make you repent is to bring you through the greatest time of trouble and sorrow that you have ever seen before. The Bible calls it in the Old Testament the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of Jacob's sorrow. It calls it in the New Testament the Great Tribulation. We serve a God who is going to bring back all the northern tribes from where they've been scattered, the southern tribes from where they were scattered, Literally, to the four corners of the earth, the Bible said that would happen. And he's going to bring them back to the land. And we see it happening in our day. I think almost all of us, except the young people here, have been alive since Israel became a nation again. Back to Romans 11. Notice the next verse in Romans 11. Right after that promise that all Israel will be saved, and then we just read out of Jeremiah, all Judah shall be saved. Now we're back to Romans 11, verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them. It's not a covenant with the church. It's the covenant with Israel that Paul's been talking about. When I shall take away their sins, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. I don't know how many of you have ever had a chance to witness to a Jew. I had a lot of opportunities to do it, and I've taken them. I find that the Jews in Israel are a whole lot more open and receptive than the Jews here in the United States, though I have actually spoken on archaeological subjects to various Jewish groups here in the, in the U.S. But I've had many personal conversations, looking and searching through the Old Testament scriptures that they might see their own Messiah, the one who loved them, the one who died in Jerusalem. Dear friends, right now, they're enemies for our sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the ones who are considered the fathers. God still loves them in spite of their recalcitrant spirit, and God made some promises to them that God will keep. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't change when God makes a promise. We have studied in the past how that Israel as a nation is the principal illustration of the doctrine of election and of the doctrine of chastening of the elect in the Bible. That is the principal illustration. When you look at Israel, you've got the entire Old Testament to see God dealing with his elect and the way in which he chastens those who are his elect. God deals with Israel as an elect group of people to give us a visible illustration of how God deals with us as elect individuals.
the history of Israel was given to teach us. Moreover, brethren, 1 Corinthians 10, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. <laughs> Every one of the Jews that got out of Egypt went through all five of those things. Every one of them. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. By the way, if you're missing the Wednesday evening presentations, you're missing a lot of what Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians, and a lot of what we've been talking about in the book of Exodus here on these Sunday mornings. Because you're seeing on location, right now, we're going through that part of this series, you're seeing the pictures on location of the different places in Egypt where Israel was held in bondage. It's fascinating. Join us on Wednesday evenings. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6. Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Israel is a physical, visible representation to teach us a lesson about how God deals with his people. Verse 11, again Paul says it, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So don't get puffy about it, don't get proud about it, don't think we're so much better than Israel was, because look at us, after all, hey, hey, here we are. You know what the next verse says? Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. It's an example, and it is a warning. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Lesson 21 that we studied last week, Paul uses the repentance of Israel as a nation to prove the elective purposes of God. Number 22, God sovereignly ordained the temporary fall of Israel to open the door for Gentile salvation and to bring Israel to repentance. <laughs> Provoke them to jealousy. That's the terms that Paul uses here. It's a temporary fall. It's not a permanent fall. Paul says so in Romans chapter 11. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, that's us, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, that is, other Jews. Get them jealous about it. Whoa, God is blessing Gentiles. Hey, he's our God. Why isn't he blessing us? Have we missed something? Yes. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. God himself, the Messiah, is the root. Some branches were broken off, but those branches, which speak of Israel, as Paul goes on to explain, can be regrafted in. We, as a wild olive tree, were grafted into the root, and we don't sustain the root. The root sustains us. And God's going to take the branch that was broken off and graft it back in. Paul goes on to say that all the way through verse 25. In other words, the church does not replace Israel. The church does not become Israel. The church is merely grafted into the root, according to Paul in Romans 11. Israel as a nation will be regrafted when Israel as a nation repents. That is so key. That is why you need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That is why you need to pray for repentance in Israel. That's why you need to pray that God will open the blinded minds, for blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. 
And so shall all Israel be saved, that is it written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Romans 11, 26 and 27. 24. That is point 24 that we've studied. We're looking at the 25 things we've learned thus far about the covenant of the land. 24th one was Israel's national repentance and salvation comes at the end of the seven-year Great Tribulation period. Number 25, we learned last week that during the final three days of the Tribulation, God will open their eyes. They will repent and they will return to the Lord. That's in the book of Hosea, a very little known minor prophet. You should study it, you should read it. We've talked about the content of Hosea and how Israel was uh, like an adulterous wife to God. And how God said he would redeem her, even as Hosea was told to buy that adulterous wife back off the slave market after she'd gotten so low and had been with so many different men. And that's how Israel was with all the pagan gods. She'd gone whoring, as the Bible puts it, after all these false gods. But finally she was being sold on the slave market. And God told Hosea, go buy her back. Because that's what I'm going to do with Israel. Even though she's rearing out like a whore against me. I love her. I made a promise to her. I will buy her back. That's a powerful promise that God makes to a nation in rebellion. If you remember those verses, Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3, where there is this repentance here at the end of the tribulation period. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Last three days of the tribulation. God has to drag them through that horrendously horrible period of time, worse than anything they've ever known before. Because that's what's necessary to break their stubborn, rebellious hearts. Where they cannot have any other option of safety and salvation. Where they must turn to their Messiah. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come down unto us as the rain as the latter and former rain upon the earth. That proud, independent spirit will finally be broken when they see they have no hope in the flesh. And as I said last week, no hope in their military genius, no hope in their technical skills, no hope in their incredible culture, no hope in their talents and abilities, no hope in their grit and determination, no hope in their wealth and possessions and ability to blend in. They will have no place to turn, no place to hide. Their only option left is to turn to the Messiah and to cry for his deliverance. They trust their Iron Dome today, the IDF, the Mossad, their banking skills, Jewish donations from around the world, their creative inventiveness, their human strength, their skill. But at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the time of Jacob's sorrow, the end of the great tribulation, all of that's going to be taken away. Only the Messiah will be left for them. And he will deliver them when they cry to him. Number 26, new material. Chastening, which is what God will have to do with Israel and which he does with us, chastening is proof of three things. The tribulation is the ultimate form of chastening, if you can imagine that. But chastening does three things. Number one, it proves God's love. That may be tough for you to wrap your mind around, but you're going to see it in Scripture in just a moment. Chastening is proof of God's love. Number two, chastening is proof of God's election. Chastening is proof of God's election. And number three, chastening is God's guarantee 
that you will come to repentance. Chastening is God's guarantee that you will come to repentance. He just doesn't shrug his shoulders and walk away. You remember what we read back there in Romans 11, 28? It's concerning the gospel of their enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. There are two of the issues right there, election and love. The proof of God's election and the proof of God's love. Touching the election, they are beloved. They are loved. They are loved. God doesn't do this to them because he hates them. God does it to them because he loves them. Don't you know Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6? Written, by the way, to the church at Jerusalem, before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by Titus, the Roman general. It was written to warn them not to go back to the old ways, not to compromise, not to go back trusting the law, but to recognize their freedom in Christ. That's what Hebrews is about. Five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. And there's this immense discussion about chastening in all of that. Written to Jewish believers in the city of Jerusalem before the destruction of Jerusalem. Chapter 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, this is a quote, by the way, from the book of Proverbs. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now get verse 6. What does chastening prove? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And it goes on, if ye be without chastisement, of which all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You're not legitimate children of the Father. You may be pretending to be a child of the Father, but you're not one of his legitimate children. Fathers chasten their own children. They spank their own children not somebody else's children. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. You see, God loves Israel. And that's why he chastens them until they repent. Those of you who are parents, and you know I'm a dad of 13 kids. Why did we spank our kids? Because just we were mad at them? Because they offended us? No. Because we wanted them to repent of whatever sin they had committed. We didn't damage them. As you know, they've all turned out very well. We chastened them because we loved them. Sometimes it was a broken heart that we chastened them. Until they cried and said, I'm sorry, Abba, or to my wife, I'm sorry, Ima. Whom the Father loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. We did it because we love them. God chastens his people because he loves them. He chastens them until they repent. God chastens his recalcitrant children. God himself said, and he said it quite a few times, that Israel is a rebellious, stubborn, and stiff-necked people. Those are the three key words that God uses for Israel in the Old Testament. Stubborn, rebellious, and stiff-necked. Let me just read you a few verses. All the way back here in the book of Exodus, God's called them out of Egypt. Moses is leading them through the wilderness. And God says this to Moses. Exodus 32, 9. The Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, folks, I'm not criticizing the Jews when I'm reading these passages. This is what God said about them. By the way, it's something he says about us, too. Exodus 33, 3. He's going to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Verse 5, For the Lord hath said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. 34, 9, And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people. 
Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 6. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. We're talking about the land. God's giving them the land. God says, you know, you're a stiff-necked people. Before I can fulfill this full promise, we got to take care of this stiff-necked problem. Deuteronomy 9.13 Furthermore the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Deuteronomy 10.16 Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your hearts, and be no more stiff-necked. They thought because they were going through the physical circumcision that they were okay. God said the problem is not what you're doing on the outside. The problem is with your heart. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 8, Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary. You know, God says the same thing about them over in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. Stephen's sermon, after he's been arrested, he's standing before the Sanhedrin, and he's recounted for them the history of Israel. And at the end of this, they're going to hate him, and they're going to stone him to death, but listen to what he said. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. That's what we've just read the Old Testament prophets said. That's what God said about them. They didn't want to hear it. And Stephen quotes, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. God calls them stubborn. I'll read you just a couple of verses. Our time is over. Judges 2.19, It came to pass when the judge was dead, and they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them. Remember the spiritual adultery that God says Israel had committed? Serving other gods. And to bow down unto them, they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn ways. Psalm 78, 8. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious, that's the third word, generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. I've got probably another 25 verses here dealing with Israel as a rebellious people. Oh, God. God put up with them. It's amazing that he did. Folks, let me tell you something. Remember, Israel is an illustration for us, a visible illustration of how God deals with his people. And as Israel was stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious, you and I are stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious. Be thankful that there is a God who has elective purposes and who gives you eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. John chapter 10, Jesus speaking. Because we are a rebellious, a stubborn, and a stiff-necked people. What is the solution? The same solution that God has called Israel to do, to repent. You say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? Are you still walking in the old ways? Are you still walking in stubbornness and rebellion and doing your own thing? Walking in the ways of the world, walking in the ways of the flesh, deciding what you want to do, what's right in your own eyes, just like the entire theme of the book of Judges? Or have you turned 180 degrees? Metanoia, the Greek word, means to turn around 180 degrees and go the other way. That's what repentance is. Not talking about feeling sorry, not sorry that you got caught, but by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God, by the power of God, having your life revolutionized so that Jesus Christ has the preeminence in everything. You can't do it in the flesh. You simply can't. But that's why God has given you His Holy Spirit. Emphasize Holy Spirit. Be ye holy, says God, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Well, our time is up. We'll have to pick up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had today to study your word, to hear what you have said, not merely about Israel, though there are great and precious promises for them, 
but how they are an example for us. That we should not lust after the same things that they lusted after. That we should not fall into the same sins that they fell into. That we should not be a stubborn people, a stiff-necked people, a rebellious people. While we put on a pious face like the Pharisees did, when ultimately they stoned Stephen to death. A man who pointed out to them that they had rejected the very word of God. The living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, again we pray for Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that your Holy Spirit will make a great sweeping movement across the Jews and bring salvation before the tribulation comes upon them. For you will bring them ultimately as a nation to repentance because you love them. Whom the Father loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Cause us to learn from that, Father, that because of your elective purposes, because of your great love, you will use chastening in our lives if we refuse to walk by faith in obedience to the word of God. But you empower us so that with joy we can do it if our stubborn will will but be broken. Father, we commit this, your word, to you, to use in our hearts as you see fit. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 568, May the Mind of Christ My Savior.